Autism, or Autism Spectrum Disorder, refers to a broad range of conditions characterized by challenges with social skills, repetitive behaviors, speech, and nonverbal communication. Autism affects an estimated 1 in 54 children in the United States today. There's not one autism, but many subtypes. These are influenced by combining genetic and environmental factors. Each person living with autism has distinct strengths and challenges. Some may require significant support in their daily lives. Others may need less support, and some live completely independently. Nicholas Godijohn lived his life with autism, sometimes looking in the mirror and not recognizing the face that looked back. He attributes these moments to the development of many of his personalities that he claims to have. Diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, his mother and stepfather knew he was different, but never imagined he could do the very thing he is serving a life sentence for. Finding the love of a woman was something he wanted, just like everyone else out in the world. Find someone you're ever after. In the world of technology, it is easier than ever to get out there and find the one you can spend the rest of your life with. Dating sites emerge from the ground out into the world wide web. Whatever your preference is, long-term relationships, check. One night stands, check. Sites to find someone to commit an affair with, check. Someone willing to fulfill the kink you're scared of everyone knowing about, check. People connect from around the world. For Nicholas, it was no different. Finding the right person to accept him for the quirks he is very aware that he has, accept him for the kink he is drawn to, and love him despite it all. Nicholas just wanted the love of another, and Gypsy, she wanted that too. But a requirement was a way out. Doing whatever it took to not only satisfy and help them to develop the feelings of lust and love, but to love her meant to help her escape what her life has become. In the search for finding love, neither were ready for what would happen when they crossed paths. Actions Nicholas' parents never thought he was capable of, and for Gypsy, the end of the endless onslaught of doctor visits, medications, and procedures. A chance to make decisions for herself, to live a life like those around her. Sometimes the love spell is broken, and all that is left in its wake is destruction. And in this case, death. Welcome to the True Crime Librarian. I'm your librarian and host, Ashley. Tonight, we wrap up the baffling case of Gypsy Rose and the murder of her mother, Claudine Dee Dee Blanchard. Gypsy was starting to piece together, and the picture was far worse than she thought. Gypsy knew she was being abused, but had yet to realize to what extreme. It would take less to finally cut her free from the only ailment she had. Her controlling mother. Dee Dee wasn't letting go of Gypsy if she didn't have to. She went to great lengths to keep Gypsy firmly locked in her grip. Fraudulent birth certificates, forged medical records, and medical test results, scamming charities whose mission is to make a sick child's life all that it can be before the conditions worsen. Dee Dee had managed to have an extravagant life thanks to the learned behavior from her mother and perfecting it to make Gypsy her own personal cash cow. 24 years worth of free trips and money she never earned was all she was going to get because despite her efforts, her daughter was stronger than she wanted her to be, strong enough to defeat her. Warning. This episode contains graphic detail of abuse, medical procedures, murder, and adult language. Listener's discretion is advised. 
If any of this is too much for you, please skip this episode or have someone listen with you or for you. Good evening, my true crime nerds. You guys crushed the premiere of Above All Else last week, making it one of my top cases to cover right here on TTCL. For that, I cannot thank you all enough. I ask you to keep listening and keep spreading the word on TTCL by reviewing, recommending, or even heading over to the truecrimelibrarian.com and smashing that donation button. Every little bit helps grow the show. Growth means I get to keep digging into those cases you want to hear and finding the details you never knew about. Sadly, the anniversary merch has left the store, but there's still some great stuff available. So head over there and pick yourself up something to celebrate how awesome you all are. We continue our true crime nerd love to the family of those fallen heroes in the Cabal airport attack. Their names can never be said enough. Their legacy can never be forgotten. Marine Corps Lance Corporal David Espinoza. Marine Corps Sergeant Nicole G. Marine Corps Staff Sergeant Darren Taylor Hoover. Army Staff Sergeant Ryan Knoss. Marine Corps Corporal Hunter Lopez. Marine Corps Lance Corporal Riley McCollum. Marine Corps Lance Corporal Dylan R. Marola. Marine Corps Lance Corporal Kareem Nakao. Marine Corps Corporal Deegan William Tyler. Marine Corps Sergeant Johnny Rosario. Marine Corps Corporal Humberto Sanchez. Marine Corps Lance Corporal Jared Schmitz. Navy Hospital Corpsman Max Sovic. These names can never be said enough. We thank you for your service and for your sacrifice. Now to what you all came here for, the true crime. So let's do a little recap of last week's episode, shall we? Dee Dee may have been a victim of Munchausen by proxy at the hands of her own mother. With her being the baby of the family, she was pretty much given whatever it was she wanted. But her siblings learned that they had to work hard for the things that they wanted. This could be the underlining of Gypsy's life. When she was born, almost immediately she became an ill child. Dee Dee was juggling taking care of her mother and Gypsy. Both seemed to occur illnesses like collectible baseball cards. Emma wasted away, and Dee Dee perfected her craft. She was a young 25-year-old divorcee and never really worked a day in her life. Dee Dee's mother, Emma, died at her hand, and it wasn't long before her new stepmother was bedridden, and Dee Dee was under scrutiny for possibly poisoning Laura with Roundup. But don't worry, she was shaping Gypsy into the most lucrative child ever. Rod, Gypsy's father, was working hard to take care of his daughter and his ex-wife and trying to keep up with the mounting medical bills and his new bride and their expanding family. In 2005, Katrina provided the perfect blanket to continue the abuse of Gypsy and land the single mom and ill child in Springfield, Missouri, a new place to work her false claims on and new charities to wrap around her fingers. In Missouri, Gypsy would get a glimpse of what normal life looks like for girls her age. 
the desire for friends, a lover, and someday a family of her own began to burn deep inside. And it was a matter of time before Dee Dee's cash cow would become her downfall. So once Gypsy was finally set free after her last transgression where she had run away from home, and then her punishment was to be locked up and chained to her bedroom for about two weeks. Now, how many of you question when Dee Dee showed up to go get Gypsy from the 36-year-old man's home, the situation, and it was lacking something, right? Surely, there would have been more to be done when a 36-year-old man is hiding a 15-year-old female in his home. Maybe, like, calling the police? Here's the thing with this encounter. Dee Dee came in running her mouth, putting fear in the mind of the man who thought he was helping a girl escape an abusive home life. How dare he take a 15-year-old teenager? Well, if the police had been called, Gypsy had in her possession paperwork and the Medicaid card showing her birthday to be July 27, 1991, meaning there wasn't a damn thing that could be done. Gypsy could have stayed there in that apartment that night. The man was doing nothing illegal, but what was at risk? The entire life and world that Dee Dee had fabricated, right? So let's make it look like, you're lucky I don't call the police. When in reality, the only one that had, to, had the greatest risk of being led away in handcuffs was Dee Dee herself. So Dee Dee gets Gypsy home, ties her up, Mrs. Mills here and there, and eventually she's confident Gypsy won't do it again. Well, she also takes measures. I mean, the laptop is completely smashed. There's no phone. Bells are put on the doors. That way, if Gypsy did it again, Dee Dee would hear her leave. We do find out later Dee Dee is a light sleeper or was a light sleeper, but did have to have medication of her own to combat some insomnia. In 2012, Gypsy gets a taste at love. She joins a Christian dating site looking for love, maybe one that her mother would find suitable, and that way everyone could be happy. In reality, though, that was not possible. Enter Nicholas Godijohn. John. Nicholas was born May 20th, 1989. He's just two years older than Gypsy, but age is just a number between these two. Nicholas describes their relationship as love at first sight. Gypsy says it was a whirlwind romance, one that progressed fast and passionate. One week, the two were exchanging DMs regularly and at night only. As Gypsy had use of her mother's laptop after Dee Dee had went to bed, just getting to know one another, and then next, they were in this full-blown adult relationship. One thing that neither had experience in. Gypsy was up front with her medical history in the beginning, telling Nicholas that she was in a wheelchair and that she couldn't walk. She told him of her cancer, of her muscular dystrophy, the list as Gypsy knew it, he knew it too. But Nicholas didn't care. He was already in too deep at that point, but even if he hadn't been, he wouldn't have let that come between them. He himself, he had flaws. He was autistic. The level of autism in Nicholas is hard to pinpoint. He was diagnosed with autism when he was in grade school. Still, he graduated from high school, making it through the basic necessity, but had yet to progress from there. There is a chance had Nicholas found another girl to talk to that night instead of Gypsy, he would still be living at home with his parents today. Not completely unable to live on his own, but not completely dependent on a caretaker either. Listening to Nicholas speak either during his interrogation or the few interviews he has agreed to, you can tell that his way of thinking is different. But nothing just jumping out at you screaming to be seen. He has words he favors, most on the spectrum do. He has motions and movements that others exhibit too, but he is clear and concise in his speech 
and delivers his message well. Based on the evaluation following his arrest for the murder of Dee Dee, Nicholas was found to have an IQ in the range of about 82. He has the mindset of a 10-year-old. Nicholas was drawn to the internet because it was one of the few places he felt like he could be himself. And it wasn't long after beginning their relationship that it went adult and quick. So in 2013, Nicholas introduced Gypsy to BDSM, bondage, discipline, dominance, sadism, and masochism. No need to go into explaining, we've all heard of Fifty Shades of Grey, which normalized the BDSM culture. Gypsy was new to it all. Sex, sexting, masturbating, just everything. Nicholas opened the gate for her and seemingly shoved her through. Now, don't get me wrong, Gypsy didn't do anything that she didn't already consent to. It's in this time, as they explore their sexuality with each other, that Gypsy begins to split herself to match those personalities of Nicholas. Nicholas claims to have multiple personalities, or DID, Dissociative Identity Disorder. His infamous one is Victor, the 500-year-old vampire who becomes dominant of Nicholas's consciousness when he is angry. Nicholas has not been dis- diagnosed with the disassociative identity disorder or multiple personality disorder in his time since being incarcerated and wasn't diagnosed prior to the arrest. Those with DID have two or more separate personalities they, and they control based on the person's behavior at different times. This could lead to gaps in memory and other problems. This is where my problem lies with Nicholas and his other personalities. And I'm using air quotes here because he retains much of his memory despite who or which personality is in control. Most have seen this disorder play out on the big screen and the most recent and probably biggest blockbuster is Split, whose entire story was based on having multiple personalities. When watching this be portrayed, you can get a sense of what a patient who has this disorder goes through. That, however, does not make any one of us an expert on the disease. So to say that Nicholas is acting or truly experiencing the Split is not for us or I to decide. Gypsy plays into this with Nicholas, and like I said, she develops her own personas to dawn depending on the personality Nicholas is portraying at the time. There's Demona. She was a half-human, half-werewolf. Kitty, she was the child inside a gypsy, and thanks to being outwardly seen as a younger person than she was, This was probably her easiest to tap into. Then there was Ruby. She was fit for Gypsy's evil side and made the perfect companion for Victor. We also have Candy. She's Gypsy's slutty side. Probably the most submissive to Nicholas during his moments needing the BDSM role to feel sexually satisfied. Thanks to Gypsy having her head shaved, she had these wigs, and she regularly wore them when dressing up in cosplay, and another way that Gypsy was able to to really hone in on these personalities to fit with Nicholas. She would rather live in fantasy than face what was going on in her day-to-day life, and who can blame her considering what we know? Each of Gypsy's alter egos have a different wig, and Gypsy would match the makeup and outfits to each of them. Candy is probably one of her most risque photos out there on the internet. We didn't see these photographs come to light till later in this case, and then we see that Gypsy transformed because when we're first introduced to this case you look at it and you see this this sickly child 
with big glasses and no hair and cap teeth and your 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 empathy swells because no matter what you're going through it can't be as bad as this child right but then these photographs are coming out and she's dressed in all of these different costumes and wigs and putting herself in positions that never would have crossed your mind had you not known that side of her. You would not know she was capable of becoming these different personalities. This is something I think that helps play into true crime nerds or junkies or whatever you want to call yourself. That's what plays into it with this case because what you think you know, you don't know. And when you think you have it figured out, it switches on you again. In March of 2013, during his time with Gypsy, Nicholas earned his very first criminal offense. While in a McDonald's in Waukesha, Wisconsin, Nicholas was there for about nine hours. During that time, he was accused of watching porn and masturbating. The police were called and Nicholas was charged with disorderly conduct and carrying a concealed weapon. Found on Nicholas's person, he had a foldable, very large pocket knife. Now, where it's a little fuzzy to tell is whether or not Gypsy was aware of this arrest because this was during their time that they were talking. If she was, she has not spoken publicly about this. And I can't help but wonder if she did know, would she have seen the red flag? Or was she so wrapped up in the exit that she she was, you know, blind to this negative side? I don't know. In 2015, Gypsy and Nicholas decided that it was finally time to meet in real life. Gypsy was going to show Dee Dee that there was someone out there for her and she was capable of having a boyfriend. So Gypsy, she took some of the money from one of her mother's mini stashing places around the home and sent anywhere from about $500 to $800 for this initial meeting. Nicholas bought himself a ticket on a Greyhound bus to Springfield, Missouri and he was there for when Gypsy and Dee Dee went to go see the new live action Cinderella. With Gypsy, like I said, anytime she had the opportunity to dress up, she did. So when she went to go see the premiere of the new Cinderella, she was dressed as Cinderella. Nicholas comes dressed sort of like Prince Charming. There's a photograph of the two of them from their first meeting and she has on the blonde curled wig and the blue signature Cinderella dress. And, and Nicholas, he has on this white sh collared shirt and almost vest like that you would see Prince Charming wearing in many of the Disney movies. So you can't help but notice that they are putting together this fairy tale love story. Immediately, Dee Dee became leery of Nicholas because what was this guy doing alone going and seeing this children's movie? And Nicholas, he couldn't have been any less obvious. He chose a spot very close to Gypsy and Dee Dee, and before long, the two were talking and talking more than Gypsy was paying attention to Dee Dee. And Dee Dee was not happy. When planning their fairy tale encounter, the two decided that it would also be the perfect time for Gypsy to lose her virginity. Nicholas excused himself to go to the restroom, and shortly Gypsy followed. There in the bathroom, in the movie theaters, Gypsy and Nicholas shared their first kiss, and their first time being intimate. Now, Dee Dee did grow suspicious of how long her daughter was gone, and she decided to get up and go see what was keeping her. Thankfully, the two had already exited the bathroom by the time Dee Dee caught up with them. 
However, Gypsy was still going to pay. When Gypsy and Dee Dee got home after this meeting, Dee Dee began to slap her. He, she began to hit Gypsy, calling her a bitch and a whore. Dee Dee hated Nicholas for what he was capable of doing, taking center stage in Gypsy's eye. It was around this time, due to the abuse that Gypsy was was a victim of, she and Nicholas began planning what is known as Plan C. Now, Plan C was discussed in links with these two. They researched arson, make it look like maybe a candle got knocked over and started a home, the house fire, and somehow, some way, Gypsy would survive it. Well, that was a little bit hard, harder to plan, so they started to research shooting her. But not only was there not a gun in the home, just Gypsy was very quickly learning. She didn't have it in her to take the only person to care about her out of this world. They decided on using a knife. Nicholas had experience in using a knife. And when he was arrested, like I said, he was found with a very large folding knife. But Nicholas, he wasn't capable of killing Dee Dee either. But he said he knew someone who was. Victor. He forced Gypsy to ask Victor, quote, Victor, will you kill my mother? End quote. Now, here's another weird thing, if this case isn't already weird enough for you. Victor was planning to rape Gypsy's mother after she was murdered. Gypsy said she didn't want that for her mother, so instead she offered herself to Victor. Nicholas has something off mentioning raping Dee Dee. There's something in there that just isn't clicked right, right? And somewhere in the back of Gypsy's mind at the time, this probably sent off a very bright red flag. But Gypsy was still trapped, and no one had given her the attention like Nicholas had. So agreeing to take her place lowered the intensity of that flag a little bit. Each time that Gypsy and her mother got into an argument over something, Gypsy did to alert Dee Dee that she was wanting more out of life, the more Nicholas and Gypsy would talk of Plan C. Details were eventually ironed out. She would send him money for his Greyhound ticket down and for a motel room. Then he would come over after her mother went to bed and Gypsy would have set out the knife, gloves, and some duct tape. Were there ever moments that Gypsy second-guessed Plan C? Yeah, you can probably guarantee that. Things are going great. The sky always looks bluer. There's hope to be seen. But when things are dark, you can't see two inches in front of your face. And you'll do anything to gain a little bit of sight. Well, June 10th, 2015, Gypsy had hit her limit to by this point. Nicholas had arrived by bus the day before and was held up for a day in the motel room. Like I said, all of which was paid for by Gypsy. By this point, she had found most of her mother's money stashes and sent Nicholas some more money, you know, um, and they were stockpiling. They were going to live off of this until they figured out their next step. Gypsy texted Nicholas that her mother was going to bed, and, ne and Nicholas texted back and forth with her as he rode to her house in a cab. One of the texts suggests she is naked when Victor sees her after the murder. As possibly a way to ensure that Victor weren't hurt, Gypsy, I mean, there's that probability, especially if there's a chance that in the rage he could hurt Gypsy. Then Gypsy got the text for her to get her ass in the bathroom. Nicholas entered the home wearing the gloves she had provided him and had the large hunting knife and tape. Gypsy said that she went into the bathroom. She crouched down in almost a fetal position, 
put her hands over ears, hoping to drown out anything that she could hear. Dee Dee screamed for Gypsy. Did he scream for help? She asked Nicholas who he was, and Nicholas answered to her, your worst fucking nightmare. He stabs Dee Dee 17 times. She had gone quiet just before Nicholas stopped wielding the knife. In the bathroom, Gypsy got up, and she was naked as instructed. Nicholas made her bandage a wound he got during the stabbing, during the attack of Dee Dee, and then he proceeded to rape Gypsy. Nicholas claims that this is a consensual encounter between the two of them in his interviews, but when Gypsy speaks out, she's very adamant that this was everything but consensual. Then Gypsy and Nicholas packed the little she had left and the two left the home and went back to the motel that Nicholas had been staying at. They took with them the hunting knife, and they stayed another couple days at this motel before getting on a Greyhound bus to Big Ben, Wisconsin. They decided the best thing to do was to mail the knife to Nicholas's home in Wisconsin so that neither one of them could be caught with the murder weapon. Gypsy wore a wig and Nicholas helped carry her things, but she walked right out of that dungeon she had been kept in her entire life. There are videos of the two that night after the murder. Gypsy is laughing and making lewd remarks about sexual things that they are going to be doing. Later, Gypsy looks back at this and she reveals she's extremely high. She had taken from the home some Xanax and other medications to help drown out those moments of resentment and self-hatred that happened that night while she listened from the bathroom. Facebook comes to play with Gypsy and the remorse that she has, and it happens almost the moment they get back to Nicholas's house in Big Ben. Even 600 miles away, there's remorse. Gypsy and Dee Dee shared a Facebook page. It was a place for all of those who came to know the mother-daughter pair to keep up with the journey and keep up with Gypsy's fight. There, Gypsy posted on June 14th, 2015. That bitch is dead. Naturally, those who knew Dee Dee and Gypsy knew this wasn't the way that either one of them spoke and something alerted many and concern poured through the comment section at 3.32 p.m. At 3.49 p.m., Gypsy commented on the same post, quote, I fucking slashed that fat pig and raped her sweet, innocent daughter. Her scream was so fucking loud, lol, end quote. Police had already been notified by those who lived close to Gypsy and Dee Dee, and now people are starting to drive over and go check on the Blanchards. Now, when police come out for their welfare check, there's nothing outwardly showing that they are in danger, so there's no probable cause for them to enter the home. However, a neighbor and some of Dee Dee's closest friends realized the kitchen window was unlocked, and he asked if there was anything stopping him from going into the Blanchard's home and checking it out while the police were waiting on a search warrant. There was no dispute. And once inside, he, he found all three of Gypsy's wheelchairs. And when he walked into Dee Dee's bedroom, he saw her laying face down, covered in blood. There's something seriously wrong here. Dee Dee's dead and her sickly daughter is missing. This sent those who knew the two into a panic. Did she have her medicine? She didn't have her wheelchair, so in the eyes of everyone that knew her, she had to have been carried out of the home. With everything that was wrong with her, it was only a matter of time, a matter of time before something catastrophic could happen with Gypsy in her life. So there was an APB put out on Gypsy. I do not think that an Amber Alert was ever issued 
as there was no direction we knew they were going in. We didn't know if there was a vehicle they were in. There's no description of a kidnapper. And all of these need to be points for a Amber Alert to happen. None of that occurred. On June 16th of 2015, the IP address from where the Facebook post had originated from was tracked down to Big Ben, Wisconsin, Nicholas's home. And with the help from Wisconsin Sheriff's Department, Nicholas and Gypsy were taken into custody. And to everyone's astonishment, here's Gypsy out of the home with none of the medical equipment they thought she needed, and she's walking. Those who knew the mother-daughter duo were stunned. Their neighbors feared if anything they thought they knew was true. Rod got a call that Gypsy had been arrested and they were extraditing his daughter back to Missouri with her boyfriend for the murder of Claudine Blanchard. He was shocked, but even more shocking was to watch his daughter walk into her bond hearing with no help from anyone. Nothing about the Blanchards were what anyone thought there was. This is where this case takes grasp on the spectators. When this sickly girl who had been to Disney on Make-A-Wish trips won Child of the Year for Olay, it's, she's now walking and she doesn't have the mirage of medical equipment that We've grown accustomed to seeing her with. What is, what's going on, right? Why is this not adding up? My favorite saying, two plus two does not equal four here. Well, we got to take a look at the fraud and the extensive story that went into this. Some say the Blanchard scammed millions from mothers. Others say it's in the hundreds of thousands. What we do know is at least 150 of that came from Rod himself. Not $150, $150,000. He sent his wife every month for the last 24 years for child support, alimony, and medical needs. The more that is uncovered about this huge scam, the worse it seems to get. First, Medical records from New Orleans were not washed away in Katrina. Gypsy's lawyer was able to obtain these records in mass amounts. Diseases that she thought she had, she never even came close to having. No muscular dystrophy. No seizures that were not medicine-induced. No need for the feeding tube. And no need for anything except a pair of glasses. The systematic abuse was starting to come to a head. What else was there about Dee Dee and Gypsy that no one knew? As a parent, I can't imagine everything that is running through Rod and Gypsy's stepmother, Christy's head at this point, as they watch this unfold about their child. Dee Dee had become a master in the sport of Munchausen by proxy. And this is a disorder that most people did not know about until this case. And the next question is, how do we handle this? The victim of child abuse for her entire 24 years finally fought back and came out on the other side alive. Then do we start with her boyfriend, Nicholas? who seemingly came out of the woodwork. Well, as Gypsy and Nicholas were being dubbed murderers of Dee Dee, the level of guilt is quickly coming into question. Nicholas wasn't performing well on his psychological testing. Could someone with his mental capacity coupled with autism understand the severity Of what he had done. Gypsy quickly split her case from that of Nicholas's. She was going to plead out even after she told him in his house prior to them being led away in handcuffs they were going to stick this out together. 
The DA and Gypsy's lawyer, Mike Stanfield, were both looking at this case like nothing they'd ever seen before. Could they truly charge her with murder in the first degree? This is where we as humans can recognize two wrongs, but stand with one more than the other due to the circumstances. Gypsy was finally charged with murder in the second degree, and in return of her guilty plea, she would get 10 years in, in the state penitentiary. She had to serve 10 years. There is no early release. On July 5th of 2016, the court accepted Gypsy's plea and stuck to the plea sentencing and served her with 10 years mandatory. We as the nation of true crime nerds were watching this all unfold in real time. Gypsy went from these big glasses, shaved head, sunken cheeks, and cap teeth to this healthy young adult. She had completely done a 180 from what most people do when they first enter jail. Where most people will lose weight, Gypsy put on 15 pounds. Her hair was starting to come in in dark curls, and Gypsy was looking better than ever. November 12th of 2018, the trial for Nicholas Goody John began. Talk of his mental capacity coupling with autism were used heavily in whether Nicholas was aware of his actions and the consequences. On day three, Gypsy took the stand and she told the story, even though some of it made her feel bad and look bad. Plan A was initially to meet at the movies and have this beginning of their fairy tale love story. Plan B was to get pregnant. Plan C was to murder her mother, Dee Dee. She told them why she didn't report the abuse was because Dee Dee had thought of this first. And how, she, how did she combat this? Well, she had medical documents stating that Gypsy was incompetent. The only thing found with Gypsy at this point is she had a little bit of a lazy eye and needed corrective lenses sometimes. Not all the time. Gypsy was healthy. They had taken her feeding tube out and had healed over. She was consuming all of her calories by mouth. She still had issues with her dental health. Um, she has a bridge. I know she has a bridge. She has several cap teeth. This was all because of all the medication she was on that she obviously did not need to be on. And her mother was letting things go because it was just even more stuff that she could get out of people. Gypsy, she had this long curled brown hair on the stand and she looks completely different than those mug shots plastered to the front of this case. Nicholas was eventually found competent to stand trial and was convicted of murder in the first degree. On February 22, 2019, Nicholas was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Both Gypsy and Nick's, Nicholas have acknowledged that their relationship has ended, even though Nicholas claims to still love Gypsy very much. Gypsy, she's very clear she has fallen out of love with Nicholas. Gypsy is up for release as early as December of 2023. At this moment, there are several petitions and motions being filed with the court to get Gypsy's sentence reduced to the level Reduced due to the level of abuse she was subjected to for so many years. Now, none of them have gathered any traction at this point. Nicholas gave one of his very first interviews since his sentencing in which he explained his DID and what happened with Gypsy. Both of the various stories line up until we get to the part of who loves who and that comes into question. That's where these two splinter off. Nicholas's attorneys are filing appeals, hoping to earn him a new sentencing trial and possible reduction in time. As of today, they have not been notified of a new sentencing trial. Gypsy is rumored to be in the works of a book based on her life set to release sometime along the lines of her release, yet it hasn't been confirmed by anyone. 
Everybody will be glad to know Gypsy has met someone through the pen pal program and the two are currently engaged to be married upon her release. Rod, Christy, and Gypsy have developed this amazing relationship and she knows he was none of the things Dee Dee claimed he was. They've met Gypsy's fiance and it looks like Gypsy is on the right track to changing the end of her story. Lastly, I was asked my opinion on this case and whether I think Gypsy should be incarcerated. Generally, I do try to keep my opinion of the case out of my infliction or the way I deliver the details or the in-betweens. I try to kind of keep this information to myself and not let it help you form your opinion one way or another. Now, many of you may not agree with me, and that is okay. That doesn't change anything for me, and I'm still going to be thankful to have you listening to the show, and hopefully you're still thankful to have me and the show in your life after this. But I was asked, and I will speak out, because this is one case that I have followed from the moment I think it started making headlines because I was I was just my jaw hit the floor because we have this murder wrapped up into this giant web of fraud wrapped up with child abuse in a form that we do not see on a regular basis all of that is in a pot stirred together and it's created this perfect media wave storm, right? So I've been following this one for a while and I can honestly say that in the beginning, these were not my views. The more I get to know this case and the more I get to know what Gypsy went through and the more I understand what Munchausen by proxy is, the more my opinion skews to the other side. Now, for those of you who don't know, I'm from Texas, and down here in Texas, we've installed what's called the express lane for those convicted of capital murder cases and sentenced to death. We don't mess around down here. You kill someone while committing another felony or someone under the age of 15, we are going to kill you as quickly as possible. But I'm one of the few Texans with a gray area. Gypsy was abused for almost the, from almost the moment she was born. She had 24 years of being under the mother who took every step for her, who handed her into medical professionals' hands because it could get her more attention. Gypsy had unnecessary medical tests, unnecessary procedures. She took unnecessary medications, and it was a parade of hospitals for her entire life. Most can say, abuse and you look at the child and they're riddled with it. It's Their body tells the story. You look at Gypsy and you see the abuse in a different form. We are trained to think that doctors know best. Doctors do what's best for their patients. But when you have a case like this, the abuse doesn't show up with bruises and cuts and contusions. They show up with pick lines, IVs, wheelchairs, feeding tubes, and a closet in the home packed full of medication. That's the abuse that we see with Gypsy. Gypsy's case is different. It doesn't make having her mother kill a free pass. When you approach an animal and cause repeated harm to that animal, it will attack back in self-defense. Granted, the dog, the cat, whatever it is, probably won't cause lethal harm, but still, you're going to end up hurt for the pain and torture you put that animal through. Gypsy made it 24 years without so much of a fight. 
where teenagers will head off to college and take their first steps into their new adult life at the age of 18, Gypsy was held on to for an additional six years. She wanted what everyone else around her was getting. She attempted the easier way with her mother, some independence through rehab, getting herself better to a point she could go out into the world and be alone. But Dee Dee wasn't going to allow her piggy bank just to walk free. Dee Dee had effectively isolated herself to those who came into her life because of Gypsy. There were no other children. There was no husband to get attention from, no mother or father. Gypsy leaving would leave her absolutely alone, and Dee Dee wasn't equipped to handle that. So Gypsy paid the price. Do I think she belongs incarcerated? Yes. She needed to serve time for the crime she committed. Ten years? No. The level of abuse, both mentally and physically, is beyond anything our imagination can build up. And Gypsy lived that for 24 years. So do I think she should walk free today, right at this moment? You're damn right I do. I will continue to support the release of Gypsy Rose because she came out of this whole thing stronger and with the power to change who her mother and grandmother were. But if you're going to ask that question about Gypsy, you're going to need to ask that question about Nicholas. It's only fair. This one for me is a little harder to say out loud. I do not support the charge of murder in the first degree. Nicholas wielded the knife, and for 17 repeated motions, he chose to take the life of Dee Dee out of the biological desire to protect. Nicholas had been evaluated mentally more times than most people in his situation, and each time those reports came back showing a lower IQ and a place on the autism spectrum. Nicholas Godejohn should serve time, and don't get me wrong, I didn't say Gypsy shouldn't have to had served time. She did too. Let's just be clear. Both of them had time they both needed to serve. But their sentences were not right for them. Nicholas may not fully understand the depth to which his decision lied. He was saving Gypsy, and in his mind, he was doing the right thing. Do I think he has some alter ego who was only capable of that? No. I think this was a way for Nicholas to have friends. And if he developed these different personas, he had different people to talk to in his mind, therefore having these friendships. He wanted the strength of the 500-year-old vampire in his everyday life, probably to combat some of the bullying he experienced. The problem I do have with this act is he was going to rape Dee Dee. He is be this could have him listed as a sexual deviant. He leads Gypsy into the world of BDSM, and this is another reason I think Nicholas should have served time. The sexual the the remark to rape Dee Dee. Let me be clear. Not because he had the fantasy of BDSM, and that is how he got his rocks off. If that's what you want to do, and that's what makes you happy, and you have a consenting partner, go for it. Have fun. You're doing something a lot of people can't bring themselves to do. But to say that you're going to murder a person and then rape their dead corpse, yeah, we've got problems. And that should be listed as one of his problems. Make no mistake, Victor or not, Nicholas was present that night. This wasn't an episode he couldn't remember occurring. He knows the details down to what he whispered to her when she asked who he was. If Nicholas was being housed in a facility capable of working with him each day to help him understand that it's okay to want to protect someone, but this is not how you go about doing it. That is where I think Nicholas needs to be. I think for him, that is where the connection drops off. Any level of protection is okay in his eyes. 
That makes him doing right. He doesn't see the levels that he could provide in protection. His, when he says he's going to protect you, it's at all costs. Nicholas shouldn't have to pay with his entire life on something he didn't fully understand. And maybe he does now. I don't know. You know, I watched his interview with Oxygen. And I'm not going to lie, you guys. He does not need to be housed in the state penitentiary. He really doesn't. He needs to be in a mental health facility capable of housing someone with his criminal past. That's where he needs to be. He needs to be able to go to therapy every day. He needs to be able to talk to people about the feelings he's having and how to deal with those. He needs to talk about his actions and, and what happened that night when he decided he was going to take Dee Dee's life. And he needs to understand each part of that, not just the whole picture, each part, each movement forward that he took that night, he needs to understand how they led to this consequence. He doesn't. Of course, you can go ahead and cue what the fucks and how could she think that? Go for it. I will gladly take your questioning and your, you know, looking down your nose is at me for my opinion on this because there's somebody out there not fighting for him hard enough. There's somebody that wasn't out there fighting for Gypsy hard enough. Don't get me wrong. Her father and her stepmother, they pulled out all the stops when it came to fight for their daughter. But they are only capable of so much. Then you have other people like lawyers and district attorneys in the state. They can also fight for you. The justice system is put into place not only to protect you as the victim, but to protect our criminals as well, to a degree. Of course, you're all going to be pissed off right now. Okay, so at the end of the day, that's someone's daughter, that's someone's son, that's someone's brother, sister, whatever, that is sitting inside of there. And regardless of the actions they chose, you do not want to hear about how they are constantly beaten or forced to do things they shouldn't have to, forced to continue to break the law, because there are guards out there that do require inmates to panhandle whatever side job they're doing because, you know, they don't get paid enough for their job. Being a criminal doesn't stop with your conviction. It doesn't stop with the end of your sentence, depending on who was there to look after you. Gypsy and Nicholas both should have had the state of Missouri looking after them. Yeah, he stabbed her. He has the mind of a 10-year-old. When you ask a 10-year-old, what they would do to protect their mother or their father if they were being harmed, they would go to the most extreme because that's how they think. They don't think outside the box. They're very concrete thinkers. Nicholas never will progress into that capability of being an abstract thinker. Not without help. He can get there. He's not incapable of getting there. Where his problem lies is in the connections and the wires in his brain. I don't believe that had Nicholas went and, and never met Gypsy, I don't think he would have ever broken into somebody's home and just stabbed them 17 times. He's not a person who would have sought out murder. He did this because he fell in love with Gypsy. He felt the pain she was going through because of what she's telling him about the abuse, something that she's trusting him with. And this drove him to fix the situation. Those were his driving forces here, not psychotic murderous rage. So I think Nicholas should be serving less time in a facility equipped to teach him 
and guide him in a way that he can understand. In a way that fits the mental health professionals. In a way that fits with what the mental health professionals are diagnosing him with. The story is far from over. We still have a few years until one walks free. And the possibility of some clarity among this story. And if that occurs, we will go back and we'll visit and talk about the psychology in which Gypsy reveals. I don't see that she could put anything out that would change my mind. I think she served time before she committed the crime. I think she was being punished long before she thought to kill her mother. I think that Nicholas was roped into a situation that forced him to protect somebody he loved. And the only way he could protect that person was by doing what they asked. And Gypsy asked, would you kill my mother? Gypsy Rose survived through some of the most terrifying operations and procedures. She was fed medications that would bring a grown man to his knees. She endured endless name calling and physical abuse when behind closed doors. Gypsy finally realized that the only way she was going to get away from this life was through having her mother killed. The man she had fallen for over the internet and brief encounter at the movies was now going to be her real knight in shining armor. He was going to take down the wicked mother and set her free, and the two would take off into the sunset and live this happily ever after life. What hasn't been considered was that once he slew her villain, she would see him in a different light. The only person she believed to care about her in the world lay dead in her bed at the hands of the man she thought she loved. Gypsy and Nicholas didn't create the perfect fairy tale. They created a psychological thriller that showed that he wasn't good for her either. Now Gypsy isn't trying to build a fairy tale love story. She's building one more fitting to her life. Gypsy has spoken openly about her story. She realizes the depths that her mother went to in turn took Gypsy with her, taking from those who needed what she got, taking advantage so that her mother stayed in the spotlight, taking things that didn't belong to them. Gypsy was taught to take it all without ever hearing her Jiminy Cricket. Now Gypsy is learning to speak the truth. No matter how good or bad it is, because she found out the punishment for lying. Now it's time to reap the rewards for telling the truth. I want to thank you all for joining me tonight as we close out this case. Season 3 is flying by and I don't anticipate it to slow down. Please don't forget to subscribe and review. And if you're joining me through the YouTube channel, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and ring the bell so that you never miss an episode. Join me next week as we embark on a case that the darkest minds could not have come up with. Daddy's girls or daddy's pawns and his sick twisted game. As always, I leave you with one last line. 
Revenge is surviving. Revenge is getting out. Revenge is being a better person than you were. And revenge is breaking the cycle. Much love, the true crime librarian. <laughs>